afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to Purdue Engineer Frontier uh, uh, Purdue Engineer Frontier Lecture Series. Uh, I'm Shao Shaimo, a faculty at Purdue Arrow. I also co-direct uh, Purdue's Institute for Control Optimization Networks, ICON, with my colleague uh, Shriya Sandram. And ICON was launched uh, four years ago with the support of Dr. Mao Chan, Dr. Rama Arvind, and uh, Dr. Uh, Wen Chen, and Dr. Chu, Dr. George Chu. And uh, ICON mission, carries the mission of uh, providing a platform for research collaboration, educational uh, coordination, and external engagement for, to address fundamental challenges in autonomous, intelligent, and robotic system. We started from about 25 faculties, and now we have about 92 affiliated faculties and about 1,000 student emails in our email list. So as a, as a major part of ICON's educational mission, we invite uh, the uh, international well-known speakers to come to visit us and give a seminar on autonomy, control robotics, and physical AI. This is also the goal of the Purdue Engineer Frontier Lecture Series. So that's why we have this joint seminar of ICON Distinguished Seminar and the PEFL Lecture. And in order to introduce, formally introduce our distinguished guest today, I would like to uh, invite Dr. George Chu, who is a professor at uh, Purdue Mechanical Engineer and also assistant dean and college engineer at Purdue. So George. It's, uh, it's a great pleasure for me to, uh, do I need this? Can you hear me in the back? Do I need this? Okay, I need it, okay. All right, I need this. So uh, it's great, gives me great pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Brian Anderson. And uh, Dr. Anderson was born in Sydney, Australia and educated at Sydney University in mathematics and electrical engineering with a PhD in electrical engineering from Stanford University. He's an emer emeritus professor at the Australian National University having retired as distinguished professor in 2016, uh, after originally being appointed as the first uh, engineering professor of ANU in 1981. Uh, his award includes the IEEE Control Systems Award of 1997, the 2001 IEEE James H. Mulligan Junior Education Medal, and the Bodhi Prize of the IEEE Control System Society in 1992, as well as the IFAC Quasa uh, Medal in 1999. He's a fellow of the Australian Academy of Science, the Australian Academy of Technological Sciences and Engineering, the Royal Society of London, and a for foreign member of the US National Academy of Engineering. Um, he holds honorary doctorates from a number of universities, including the University of Catal uh, Catholic of De Levant, Belgium and ETH of Zurich. He's a past president of the International Federation of Automatic Control, IFAC, and the Australian uh, Academy of Science. His current research interests are in distri distributed control and localization, epidemic modeling, and social networks. He also served as director of uh, companies' boards, including the world's largest supplier of implant implantable hearing devices, the Cochlear uh, LTD, as well as, and as an advisor to the government, including the membership of the Prime Minister's Science Council under the three, under three Prime Ministers of Australia. So without further ado, let's welcome our speaker, Dr. Anderson. Uh, thank you very much, uh, George, and can I begin by saying um, thank you very much also initially to my host, Xiao Shui Mo, an old friend of mine, so it's a great personal pleasure to see him, but he invited me to come to Purdue again and also to participate in this Engineering Frontiers uh, lecture series, which of course is quite an honour. And I was, I've always known uh, Purdue's engineering, uh, aeronautical and aerospace engineering department was uh, one of the leading ones in the world. Today I was told it was the second best in the United States according to current ratings, which probably means it's the second best in the world. So it's always an honor to come to a, a top institution. 
Well, thank you. And uh, now to talk about the aim of my presentation, it's to illustrate some applications problems to which control theory has been applied. And these problems were all character formulated by end users uh, and, co and they resulted in a paper which was co-authored by um, an end user person and myself. So that was kind of a test. Um, there's no common technical theme. The common feature is that each application required theory that at least at the time was advanced in order to produce a working solution to a posed problem. I'm not giving details of who published what, and the talk's very far from being comprehensive and it simplifies some matters. And in fact, um, I was asked to give an earlier version of this talk uh, a few months ago, and they said, give it over your whole career. So some of the examples are rather historic, and in that sense may appear a little bit primitive uh, to you. So instead of a conventional outline slide, I've got the six topics in which the applications arose and the collaborators on the right hand side. And uh, the first one deals with water consumption and restrictions. And the collaborator uh, was a district water board uh, on the east coast of New South Wales in Australia. And uh, this water board operated the dams and they supplied water to businesses, manufacturing, uh, commercial and um, residential uh, clients. And if you drove round the suburbs of the city of Newcastle on a hot day, a great many people had lawns and this is what the lawns looked like. Now, the water problem arose because in the 1970s there was a prolonged drought and the dams uh, ran, ran down and uh, this sort of thing, watering lawns, became problematic. And so the Hunter District Water Board imposed usage restrictions on the domestic consumption of water, principally related to how you could use it in your garden or, or on your lawn. The restrictions, um, initially anyway, just said um, you could do it on uh, alternate days, Mondays, Wednesdays and Fridays, and even house number, uh, Tuesdays, Thursdays and Saturdays, an odd house number, and either everybody could or everybody couldn't on Sunday, I don't really remember. Uh, but they did fiddle with the restrictions at, uh, at times and make them more severe, like restricting, for example, the hours of the day when you could, uh, when you could do it. And this ran for several years and the Water Board concluded that unfortunately the restrictions seemed to be ineffective and so they posed the task uh, to identify if the restrictions were effective and suggest a remedy. So that was the problem. So I'm not a water engineer so they gave me a water engineer uh, to work with and really the high level task was to estimate what the usage would have been without restrictions during the time restrictions were in force to see whether the restrictions were making a difference. Now in order to do that you've got to have a, a, a model and I had no idea of what a model would be in the first instance but I knew that the model had to be built from data in the normal years. So it you can very quickly establish that all models revolve around temperature, particularly today's temperature forecast or actual, and the rainfall, particularly today's rainfall forecast or actual. Um, in addition, the models need to reflect seasonality and need to reflect um, uh, population change. And the general form of the model before you build in population change and seasonality looks like this. Now this is, in engineering terms, um, a, a linear equation. Um, the T represent uh, temperatures and you look at today's temperature and that's J equals zero in the uh, equation. You look at, you include yesterday's temperature in and that's J equals one in the equation. You include two days ago, it's J equals two and so on. And K equals zero in the equation means you're including today's rainfall. K equals one is um, yesterday's rainfall and so on. So you have to judge how many days you need to take things into account. 
D0 is like the standard usage for getting temperature and rainfall. And of course, the model's never 100% accurate, so you've got to allow for noise, and that's this term in there, which is EI. That's the kind of inaccuracies associated with the model. Uh, so, um, round about the mid-1970s, the first books had come out uh, available for engineers with titles like identification in them, which dealt with the problem of how, given measurements, you could figure out what these coefficients were, because it's the values of the coefficients that, that constitute the model. I've just shown you the model structure. Put numbers in there and you've got the actual model. So, um, what we found was that we got a roughly okay model with um, today's and yesterday's temperature and today's rainfall. Uh, there was, of course, some error. Uh, based on historical data, we knew the increase was about 2% per annum, and we knew you had to put seasonality into it. So when you take the model up the top and put in the 2% um, adjustment of population, that gives you the multiplying factor in the parenthesis out uh, this, uh, at the start of the right-hand side of the bottom equation. And the seasonality is captured by those 2 pi d over 365 uh, cosine terms on the, on the right-hand side. And the hottest days of the year are around New Year's Day in Newcastle at six months out of phase, so to speak, with the United States. So. Um, that's why it's a cosine rather than a sine. It might have been a sine in the United States. Okay. So this was the form of the model that uh, we worked with. And so uh, we were able to estimate model parameters using data for the unrestricted years 77 to 79. And with the estimated parameters, that was a pretty good model. So in 8081, restrictions were imposed. And we ran that model, that is with the coefficients we uh, computed, with the 8081 temperatures and rainfall um, to see what we think the consumption would have been approximately had there been no restrictions. And the big surprise, with the restriction regimes, more water was being consumed uh, most of the time anyway than for the no restriction uh, regime. So the water board had sensed things correctly when they were worried about the effectiveness uh, of the restrictions. And now why was that? Well, it's a matter of simple psychology. If you're not allowed to water today, uh, if you water today, but you're not allowed to water tomorrow, you make sure you use your allowance today because it might be very hot tomorrow. So pe people, people used more because they were thinking of the fact they couldn't uh, do it tomorrow. So, um, I'm sorry. Um, I'd mentioned that the Water Board had instituted tougher restrictions at times, so we could look at the tougher restriction regimes as well as the general one which just restricted days. And we found you could get 25% savings with combined restrictions, uh, which relied on limiting the days, limiting the hours in the day, no fixed sprinklers, uh, no soaker hoses. Any hose had to be handheld, so that was another time limiter, apart from limiting the hours of the day. So that answered the water board's query, and it used identification theory that was really pretty new at the time we did it, even though today you might regard it as pretty elementary. So the second uh, problem is quite different. It, it was concerned with the suppression of flutter in uh, aircraft, and, and the particular aircraft uh, that was chosen to work with was a 767. And I had a Boeing engineer uh, come out and, and work in uh, Canberra, where I was at the time, for one year on this um, problem. And the end result, um, among the end results, was a paper with this guy too. So. Um, flutter control uh, is, is the aeronautical people <laughs> sure know, I didn't at the time, of course, uh, is, is dealing with the prevention of oscillations that are associated with simultaneous torsion and bending of the wings. 
So Boeing had a, a linear dynamical model, um, the sort of model that control systems engineers use, and it had um, two inputs and it had two outputs, and um, the outputs were the wing root stress and the torsion. And uh, it was a time invariant um, finite dimensional model, which means there were things called poles and zeros with it. And uh, some of the poles were right-hand poles, which means there's an instability that has to be controlled. And some of the zeros were right half-plane zeros, which means there's limitations on the bandwidth and the level of gain you can use if you're wanting to control uh, the instabilities. And the complexity measure, technically the state dimension in control systems terms was 55, which is pretty scary. Um, so there's a technique for controller design that's quite well known called, uh, L it's called LQR, or LQG, sorry, I sh should have written LQG. Um, so you could do a design rapidly with this and um, you have to choose certain parameters in that design and those were chosen uh, to reflect a torsion and um, bending. And uh, the controller itself had a state dimension or a complexity of 55. Now, even if you've never worked with control systems, you, you would probably think, well, oh, gee, that sounds pretty high. And everybody thought that was far too high because you cannot get intuitive understanding of a controller of order 55. It's just a mass of numbers and no one's willing, or was willing then at least, to trust just a mass of numbers. They wanted an intuitive understanding of how the controller was going to work. So what they wanted was a low order controller and the only way they could get a low order controller uh, was uh, using uh, trial and error methods and that w was 200 person years. So the problem posed was, can you come up with a, a low order controller design that doesn't take 200 person years, but takes maybe one person year? It's a question, how to efficiently determine, and it says low cost determine uh, a low order controller. So, um, the broad approach which would occur to many people is to design an LQR or LQG, as I should say, controller, and then somehow, being clever, reduce the state variable dimension of that controller. And that sounds like a simple problem because you could read in textbooks thing, how do we reduce a complex linear system that is a high order one to a lower order one. But this is not an easy problem in this case. And the reason is you want to reduce the control of the dimension, not so that the new controller is like the old controller, but rather that the new controller connected to the aeroplane is like the old controller connected to the aeroplane. And these words connected to the aeroplane uh, make sense. They also make the problem much more complicated. This is not simply a matter of simplifying the controller, you must take into account the particular context in which it's being used. It's been connected to a 55th order device. Um, so I now have to ap apologize to the non-control people, say the next two slides will be very technical and they're the most technical in the talk. And if you don't know control, you know, don't, don't worry. Uh, it won't take me long to get past the two technical slides. Okay, so here are the two technical slides, what you might call the nitty gritty detail. The plant is represented both by state variable equations, they give rise to ABC, and the controller represented by a state feedback gain F and a Kalman estimator gain, that's L, and the controller has a transfer function, which is the lower left formula. But it's also possible to represent the, the multivariable, multiple input, multiple output plant, and multiple input, multiple output controller by uh, a generalization of a transfer function, which is called a matrix fraction transfer function description. And uh, there are those X and Y's uh, matrices, the X tilde, Y tilde matrices, and these equations hold that define all these quantities. 
And uh, surprisingly, and I know it's extremely technical, this equation relates all the components, numerator and denominator, of the left and right matrix fraction descriptions of the plant and the, and the controller. So it's that equation which is the key to getting a good reduction method. Um, because uh, uh, what you can in intuit is that um, you should replace uh, D tilde and N tilde, the description of the uh, controller using a left matrix fraction description, by quantities D tilde R, N tilde R of much lower complexity, um, such that this weighted product is made as small as possible. And, and that will ensure that, that the uh, orange identity immediately above with D tilde and N tilde replaced by approximations will approximately hold. So you can find an algorithm uh, to do that. Um, and D tilde and N tilde R are the uh, reduced controller denominator and uh, reduced controller numerator. So there they are again. And the original controller is D tilde inverse N tilde and the reduced order controller is D tilde R inverse N tilde R. And separate theory will verify this approach uh, is aimed at preserving the stability of the closed loop an accuracy of the closed loop transfer function matrix. And those are the two most technical slides in my talk, and I apologise to those people to whom they meant uh, very little. So the final outcome was that a low order controller was designable systematically in one person year, and it had been uh, 200. Um, there were a couple of further outcomes. Uh, I wrote a, a commercial software manual for an industrial strength uh, MATLAB, uh, and uh, a textbook came out both in uh, English and uh, Japanese. Um, so, go on to the third uh, example, um, and this is uh, estimating the shape of a toad array behind uh, a submarine. Um, if you ever read a book called The Hunt for Red October, which is a pretty old book, you'll have read about uh, toad uh, arrays in that book. The concept of a toad array is that behind a submarine, you trail something that's a hundred, hundreds of metres long, many hundreds of metres long, and it's got acoustic sensors on it. And those acoustic sensors are listening uh, for other vessels. And they're spread out because the sensors are away somewhat from the noise of your submarine. And also you get a big antenna. And big antennas are better at collecting sound or light or whatever, in this case sound, than small antennas. And you get the big antenna by having the cable. Now, the vessel's trailing a towed array and those things marked A are the acoustic sensors that are listening for other vessels. So you've got an acoustic antenna array here that's formed using the, um, the, towing, the line, um, which is a flexible uh, thing and maybe this sort of size diameter. Um, that's hanging behind the submarine. And the shape of that array can bend it's not necessarily straight. Uh, it, it'll bend if the submarine uh, changes its direction, or it'll bend if there's uh, currents, or it'll, it might bend if there's a change in the thermal layering of the, of, the, uh, of the ocean. And to properly use the information from the elements of the antenna array, that is these things A, you must know where each acoustic sensor is. So before you can effectively use the acoustic sensors, uh, you need to estimate the shape of the array. And so you uh, want to estimate the shape of the array somehow. I should say similar technology used for seismic exploration and I think fishing. You want to estimate the shape of the array using these things DS and C, because although the model motion of the vessel and the equations for a towed cable give you an estimate of the shape. You do have modeling error and there are currents. And so, 
to get more information about the shape of the array, you can stick depth sensors on it and compasses. And those are giving you an additional level of information about the shape of the array. So this is kind of uh, a schematic of the sort of thing uh, we're looking at. The toad array is the central thing here, and it's a dynamical system. And it's actually described by a nonlinear partial differential equation, which is immediately scary. Um, there's a known motion coming from the submarine. There's unknown currents that are moving it. Um, there's modeling errors. You can write down an equation, but that's not exact. Uh, it's not the same thing as the array. Um, you, you've got measurements of it coming from the depth sensors and the compasses, uh, but they're sensor noise, so the measurements are noisy. And what you want is the acoustic sensor positions, which are kind of buried within the general shape of the uh, array. Uh, but until you know the array shape, you don't know where the acoustic sensors are. So you've got to have some sort of a gadget called a filter. And the filters uh, can only use uh, the measurements. These are these things from the depth sensors and the uh, uh, compasses. And it can use the known motion of the submarine. And somehow it's got to produce an estimate of the acoustic sensor positions. Now, this sort of setup except without the words nonlinear partial DE, which are the scary ones, is a characteristic of Wiener filtering developed during World War II, so um, 80 years ago, and Kalman filtering uh, developed uh, in the 1960s uh, and worked on since and pushed out in the direction of handling nonlinear systems and pushed out in the direction of handling distributed systems modeled by partial differential equations rather than ordinary differential equations. Now, before I give you just a wee bit more detail about how this thing worked, I also want to distinguish two different ways in which you might want to do the processing. Um, there's a, a technical distinction between what's called filtering and what's called smoothing. And in filtering, you can use the information up to now to estimate the current position of something like the acoustic sensors. And those acoustic sensors then will be able to listen for other vessels now. But now with smoothing, you can imagine that your submarine drives around the place and you collect all these measurements, or tape record them or something like that. And you could do an analysis after the event to see whether you picked up something. And so uh, if you analyze after the event, there's actually more information available to better estimate the acoustic sensor position. So you could then process the acoustic sensor positions with a, a greater uh, feeling of, of accuracy. But you can only do it after the event. So with delay. Here, here's another picture of it. You've got all this collection of measurements and you use the measurements up to the current time t to estimate the antenna positions at time t. If you take tape recordings or something like that that run beyond uh, time little t, say to time capital T, you could use the, subse the, the measurements subsequent to time t to get an estimate of the acoustic uh, set, uh, antenna the acoustic, the elements of the acoustic antenna uh, more accurately. Um, whether it's nonlinear, whether it's linear, I mean, this makes sense. More information, you should do better. The key disadvantage is that you can't do it in real time. So how do you do the, this uh, toad array thing? Um, you discretize the partial differential equation in time and space which involves choice of discretization interval in time and a choice in space. And you cannot do those independently. There are rules uh, that are quite strict about the relationship between those and it's tied to the velocity of sound. 
Um, you also use then discrete time Kalman filtering or smoothing as you wish um, to that discrete time, um, to that discretized uh, model uh, of, the, of the whole thing. So this is the sort of uh, performance that you can get, and this graph's a bit mysterious. Um, the, if the sensor error itself is, uh, say, uh, 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 one degree, then um, with the filter, uh, if you're measuring right at the centre, you'll have a one degree error. If you're estimating the error associated with um, uh, an antenna position uh, away from um, the depth sensor or uh, compass, you'll have a higher error. And the low points on these curves correspond to the position along the array of the actual sensor. I forget whether this is the compass or the depth sensor, it's one or the other. And as you move away from the depth or the comp depth sensor or the or, or the compass, um, the error associated with the acoustic array element goes up. But it goes up less if you use a smoothed uh, an estimate, and um, much less, in fact, and uh, goes up uh, as you reduce the length of the smoothing goes up if you, again, if you eliminate smoothing and is even higher if you just predict. Um, so that's a, a strange looking curve which um, highlights um, several things. First, uh, the benefit that arises from smoothing. Uh, secondly, the importance of trying to have the acoustic antenna array elements near the depth sensors and the compasses might give you insights as to what happens if you spend money and put in another depth sensor and so on. So what did the C trials actually show with this? And no one would tell me because this information is classified, okay? <laughs> <laughs> so I've got a contrast to that later. But <laughs> so I, I really don't know how the thing uh, turned out, but they did send me a nice picture of that submarine when they were doing the C trials. Um, okay, so the next uh, problem is dealing with localising the sea skimming uh, supersonic missile. And um, this was done with a company in Canberra that makes uh, naval radars that they sell quite a few to the United States as well as the uh, Australian Navy. So the ship's attacked by a sea skimming missile and the ship illuminates the missile with a high power radar. And uh, the ship uses uh, drones in its vicinity with radar receivers to measure the reflected signal from the missile and um, to measure in particular the Doppler shift. Uh, I think you probably know what a Doppler shift is, but it's what the police use when they catch you for speeding, okay? They shine a radar at your car, uh, the reflection comes back. The faster you go, the greater is the shift between the transmitted frequency and the received frequency. So the Doppler shifts and the geometric placement of the ship and the UAVs are uh, all used to localise the velocity of the missile. So how can this occur? Uh, I do want to first ex explain why it is important to use um, the Doppler shift here. Um, so this is a very much a schematic diagram. So we imagine there's a high power radar on the ship that's illuminating the missile and illuminating all the sea around the missile because the missile is very close to the surface of the sea. Reflections come back from the sea but they're barely Doppler shifted because the sea is not moving much. And so uh, that's the thing marked clutter, okay? There's also some background noise and that's that horizontal line parallel to the bottom axis. Now reflections also come back uh, from uh, the missile and they're Doppler shifted unless it's traveling at right angles to the line joining the ship to the missile. 
And generally speaking, the Doppler shift will be much greater than that from the, the waves on the, on the sea. So, uh, of course, it's, it's spread out somewhat, but the f there's a narrow frequency band where you're getting the signal back from the missile, and at that point, the clutter from the sea is much, much lower. So you're benefiting from the signal-to-noise ratio improvement that's associated with getting a Doppler-shifted uh, signal. So that, that's important in this situation. So how does the algorithm work? And how many receivers do you need? And where should you put the receivers? The receivers are these things in the, in the UAVs, in the drones. So it, you can assume the um, two-dimensional ambient space, the so three-dimensional is very easy. I'm just going to do it in two. It's simpler. So here's really the key. Uh, the, the missile's got an unknown vector velocity, that's V and the missile at any instant of time has an unknown position and that's a vector P. Uh, the UAV sensors have known position and although the measurements are noisy, they, they can measure the Doppler shift. Now when you normalize everything, um, you get a key equation from physics and that's the key equation from physics written just to involve the four quantities that I've defined above. So you'll see Fi, the first thing in the equation is known, P in the equation is unknown, Si is known, V is unknown, P is unknown, Si is known. So that's an equation which is polynomial in the four unknowns when it's R2 space, there's two components of the unknown velocity and two components of the unknown position, so there's four unknowns. So from one UAV, you get a quartic equation involving four unknowns. And those unknowns are the coordinates of the missile position and the coordinates of the missile velocity. So four, if you got, had four UAVs, you'd get four such equations and four quartic equations and four unknowns generally have a finite number of solutions. So, and noise will perturb the solutions, of course. So if you have five uh, UAVs, then in general, those equations will have a unique solution. Although if there's noise, that will destroy the solution existence. But there will always be a solution that approximately satisfies the five equations if the noise is at least small. So because of the noise, and there's always noise, um, and, and, and because of the multiplicity of solutions with just four UAVs, you need five or more uh, UAVs. So the conclusion is that there's five or more sensors should be used. And to solve this thing, you need to be able to approximately solve uh, quartic uh, equations. Um, if you have distance or bearing measurements, you may be able to cut down on the number of uh, sensors. That's pretty obvious. And you can work in um, an ambient uh, three-dimensional space if you wish. And you'd have six unknowns, three coordinates, three position coordinates, three velocity coordinates. And um, so uh, you'd need seven or more equations and thus seven or more uh, UAVs. Very little has been done on the optimum array shape. Uh, it's certainly possible to, that is the shape where you put the UAVs. It's certainly possible to identify bad positioning of UAVs. For example, if you put them all in a very, very small cluster, it's clear you're not going to be able to resolve stuff. So you've got to scatter them around. And of course, they can't get too far from the naval ship either. Okay, so uh, that again led to uh, a, a paper, as well as this answer, with uh, people from that company, or one person from the company. So, um, go on to the second last of these uh, items, um, macroeconomic modelling. So, in uh, any advanced uh, country, um, whole of economic modelling is performed. 
and it's performed by central banks and finance ministries and uh, many uh, government entities and, and even trading banks. Uh, many people want to know uh, what's happening in, in the economy. And the data used for generating those models is several hundred time series, you know, trade and manufacturing, but it fine structure, fine structure stuff, uh, employment and so on. And it is several hundred. The models are known as generalized dynamic factor models. The name's not terribly important. You might have heard of it. But in, in uh, control system terms, these are finite dimensional linear systems excited by Gaussian white noise together with additive output noise, which is a very, very common kind of framework in which, which control systems people uh, are facing. Um, and, and I should say, after allowing for seasonality and annual trends, you can sort of uh, get rid of those by pre-processing the models at a time invariant. Now, what's interesting is that although these models have dimension maybe 300 or 400 or something for the output, the vector white noise input going in is extremely low dimensional. For the European Central Bank, the dimension is four. So they've got, they've got a linear system model excited by a four-dimensional white noise with 400 outputs. So that's not like a typical control systems situation. So in a, a bit more detail, this is the way they think. They talk about a high dimension vector process, that's three or 400, and there's what you actually measure, and the measurement is signal plus noise, and the signal is called by them the common components process, this is what's produced by the full white noise inputs for the European Central Bank. And the XI is kind of local, we would think of it as measurement error or sensor noise or, or something like that. It's local and it's quite independent of the basic excitation white noise. And from time to time, N may change. So they may decide to measure this stuff in the future or so N, N, N can change. So what's wanted is a model of the common components process. And it's wanted because people typically want to do forecasting or change government policy or decide what to do about taxation rates or something like that. And the tricky feature is that you can't collect this thing over a terribly long uh, uh, time period, maybe some hundreds of months or even longer, but certainly not millions of months. Um, and, and that's not enough really to do good averaging. But on the, on the other hand, there's this capital N, which is 400, and the thing is just driven by four inputs. So it turns out in a very tricky way, you can do some averaging involving the N side as well as the T side to get quite a good model. And uh, there's certain intermediate data that's, that's found, including the spectra. And now to get these models, it's assumed that um, everything's stationary, got well-defined spectra. And so uh, in principle, you can get the spectrum of the common components process, but you want a model for it. And if you're given a spectrum, the model producing that spectrum is not normally unique. Um, if you know about spectral factorization, you might know there's a unique minimum phase spectral factor, but you can have an infinity of spectral factors of a given spectrum. So how could you get a model? So the first aspect is to fix the uniqueness with a couple of observations. These models are not square. They've got four inputs and maybe four output, uh, 400 outputs. So they're very tall. And if you've got a transfer function matrix with four inputs and 400 outputs, it virtually never has zeros. And um, it, the non-uniqueness of uh, models of spectra all comes about because of zeros. But if there's no zeros, effectively, there's no 
there's no uniqueness problem. Getting rid of the zeros means, or not having the zeros means, you don't have a uniqueness problem. And a further bonus in this model building is that um, because there's no zeros, the models order are aggressive and uh, people who do this sort of stuff will tell you it's far, far easier to estimate parameters in an autoregressive system without, that is a, something without zeros. Now, the, where I started to get involved particularly was in dealing with this issue. The time series that are collected, there are different periodicities. Some things are collected monthly because they're more volatile. Other things are collected quarterly because they're less volatile or you want some, some kind of averaging built in there. And so question is, how can you build a model and use concepts of zeros and poles and transfer functions and order regression and so on when you've got different multiplicities? And I knew where the answer to that came from, from signal processing, and it also it appears in a few control textbooks. But in signal processing, the, the idea is called uh, blocking. And in signal processing, you convert everything to a single time scale. And when you've got a single time scale, uh, you can use normal concepts of time invariant uh, discrete time linear systems. And it's a very, very simple idea in this econometrics uh, context. You get monthly data for, month, for, for January, February and March, and you say, I'm going to treat that as a three vector that I obtained in March. And so it's in a qu quarterly vector of dimension three, rather than a monthly scalar uh, quantity. So that just converts everything to a quarterly time scale. And, uh, and, and there you are in terms of um, gotten rid of the multiple periodicities. Um, if, if you ever done any digital electronics, you might have heard the term serial to parallel uh, conversion, that's all, that's all this is. Uh, so what uh, was the outcome of this work uh, was with a person from the Bureau of Labor Economics, which also is interested in these uh, countrywide models that combine the autoregressive property and the blocking idea to describe the broad class of uh, identifiable models and show how to estimate the model. Okay, so the last thing I want to talk about is flying drones in formation with limited measurements. And this is some of the most recent stuff I've done. So I want to begin with a thought experiment. There's three of you out on a playing field and you've been asked to assemble into an equilateral triangle of sides 100 metres. Uh, it doesn't matter where the centroid of the triangle is, it doesn't matter the orientation of the triangle and you have a gadget that would allow you to measure distance uh, to your neighbour. So how should each person move to as assemble into a triangle? Well, I think it's pretty clear what you do. If you're too far from a neighbour, you'd walk towards your neighbour, right? And if you're too close, you'd walk away from them. And it's, it's pretty clear without writing down any equations that you'll, you'll easily get to the right size triangle. But what if you had a blindfold on? You could still measure your distances to your neighbours, but you can't see in which direction they lie. So you know you may be too far from this neighbour or too close to that neighbour, but you, you don't, it's not clear quite how you'd move, right? So how would you do it? Or if you like, how should a formation of three agents assemble itself into a triangle using just interagent uh, distance measurements. Uh, we'll allow a cheat. Each agent's allowed to keep a private map recording their position in a private coordinate basis. A private map, their position in their own coordinate basis, which means they've got an inertial navigation system on board, but they're not GPS equipped. Because an INS system will give you a kind of private map in your own coordinate basis. GPS, it's where you're locating yourself in the global coordinates. So here's a picture of, of how they can do it if I can get this thing to go. So 
So those agents are all going to end up moving in the same direction in an equilateral triangle. And, and that was produced just by distance measurements, okay? So it's like a magician pulling a rabbit out of a hat, but I'll show you how the trick's done. Um, the agents use circling. And if you turn yourself in a little circle, um, and, I, and, I, and I measure all the time how far I are from a fixed neighbour, then I can actually work out the direction of the neighbour. So if the neighbour's moving too, it makes it much more complicated. But I can put that sort of idea together. And so what, what I've just told you is that with distance-only measurements, you can do a lot of localization of your neighbours, OK? So now I want to get on to the real problem that those ideas, which I'd had some time ago, were applied to. This is the, like the user, the user-defined uh, user problem. Agent 1 has GPS. Agent 2 is GPS denied, but has INS. And at a series of times, the interagent distances are measured. And uh, the question is, can agent 2 determine its position in global coordinates. So diagrammatically, you can imagine agent one, which is up the top, tracks its position in a global coordinate frame and, uh, and shares it with agent two down the bottom, and it tracks its positions in a local coordinate frame and shares its information with one. Both agents know have noisy values for the interagent distance at discrete time instance, and the end user question is, tell me where agent two is at, at any time. So um, to set up uh, that picture in terms of uh, an equation, um, let's uh, let PY be a local coordinate description of the GPS denied agent two, and PX is a global coordinate description of the coordinates of agent one. And this is at the same time, and Z is a measurement between them. Now, between the two coordinate bases, there's always a rotation matrix and a translation vector that relate them. Because we don't know what the rotation matrix is. We know it exists. We don't know what the translation vector is, but we know it exists. So we can write down an equation that has the measured stuff, PY, PX, and Z, and includes R and T, which transforms the coordinate basis, which we don't know. And within R and T, there's three parameters associated with R and three with T. So in all, there's six unknown parameters. So you would hope that with R and T, if you learn six distances, you may, you, with unknown R and T, and wanting to learn them, at least six distances would be needed, but maybe more to avoid ambiguities and deal with noise and so on. So a task is now to try to find R and T. So there is a way to solve a collection of such equations if you've got seven or more uh, equations. Without going into the details, you can formulate a quadratic least squares optimization problem with quadratic equality constraints. Now, if you feed that into Google Scholar, it'll give you a lot of information. Among it will be the term semi-definite programming. So semi-definite programming is a magic tool that will give you an approximate solution to these optimization problems. It is an approximate solution. And so it's not going to give you a rotation matrix. It'll give you something that's close to a rotation matrix. So there's another algorithm called a Procrustes algorithm, which will take a matrix and find a rotation matrix that's the closest to it. So you could tidy up the, rot the alleged rotation matrix that you got from step one. And at that stage, you have a rough solution for R and T. But there is a third step you can do, which is to set up uh, another sort of index, which is truly it's a representative of the physics of the situation. So it's much more appropriate for the real pr problem of interest and do gradient ascent. And you initialize it with these rough solutions. And that's so important because maximum likelihood indices are no good unless you can initialize them well. 
So steps one and two give you a good initialization for this index, maximum likelihood index, which is truly the gold standard index. You have to find R and T to minimize that funny looking function uh, where R is subject to being a rotation matrix. And that looks a hard problem and that's solvable using gradient descent uh, on a manifold and the optimization solution uh, comes from uh, semi-definite programming and Procrustes. So I'll skip that and I want to show you the results of uh, real data. Um, the circles uh, on, the, on the bottom, the lower right of the, of the uh, thing indicate uh, GPS equipped uh, UAV, the, the distances are shown in, in metres there. So it's flying approximately in a circle, some height variation. The triangles, uh, the solid line on the left indicates the actual path and the triangles uh, indicate the uh, recovered positions using this uh, algorithm, which again has the GPS denied vehicle with INS and with distance only measurements between the, the two vehicles. And I have to say, I, I was allowed to see um, the, the, the data here and uh, to get these curves. And what these curves just show is if there's a lot of noise in the measurements, you get a bad result. If there's uh, low noise in the, in the me measurements, you get a good result, but you must have about 10 measurements. So that it's, this is a demonstration that GPS denied drones can be localised by distance measurements uh, from GPS uh, equipped drones. So that brings me to question time and I've just listed the six uh, areas I've talked about here to maybe help. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Brian. That was really an illuminating talk. We have a lot of students in the audience today, so I think you know it's a great example of how control theory and maybe the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics in the physical sciences right, can make a real difference in, in real-world applications. Um, so uh, we have time for maybe two questions here for uh, Professor Anderson. Any questions in the audience to start here? Test. Uh, why would you deny certain drones like the ability to have GPS? Like, what? Why would you? Why would you study that interaction you just talked about, where some drones don't have GPS available? Okay. So um, there's there's two quite distinct reasons. Sometimes drones are flying in an environment where GPS is not available because of things around them. They could be in a cave, or they could be in a building canyon. Um, is, is that's one reason. The second is there are, are people who use GPS jammers. Uh, the Russians have used GPS jammers that have affected commercial aircraft in Syria several years ago and for a few days last December they blacked out most of Poland uh, from the base in Kaliningrad and the Russians are using them against the Ukrainian drones. So you may be able to get your GPS equipped drone out of range of uh, the jammers in, in order to deal with uh, the, the poor drone that's had its GPS jammed. Okay? Um, my question is about the fourth topic. So I don't know if missiles can do this, but if it knows that that's how they're estimating the Doppler shift. Can it emit a band of frequencies that throws off, um, like instead of just the signal being bounced off, can it also emit a band of signals? You mean, can the, the missile or its friends do something? Yes, I would, I would think uh, they, they probably could send, have an aircraft or other jammers in the sky that send signals generally in the direction of the ship in frequency bands close to and around the radar transmit frequency from the ship. 
so that it would confuse the UAVs around the ship as to whether they were picking up something from a jammer or the Doppler shifted frequency from the missile. And are there ways to sort of counteract that? I'm sorry, I, I don't know. <laughs> Thank you. We have time for one last question here. Uh, so regarding the uh, last talk on the GPS denied drones, uh, I'm curious as to how the error scales when you have like a mesh network versus just uh, like two drones as you showed. So the example. for that example, I just considered um, two drones. Uh, you know, that, that was the context in which the problem was uh, posed. But um, the, often the uh, operation of drones involves more than two. So it's just, I didn't, didn't consider it there. Uh, it so happens in a, in a more advanced paper, I think, there's some mention of more than two drones. So there may be some formation that is, uh, you know, better for minimizing error than... Uh, better in, in what sense? And minimizing, like, the error of, uh, you know, real coordinate versus predicted coordinate? Yes. Well, r remember, uh, drone formations often are put in a particular formation because of what they're trying to sense, not, not in order to optimise navigational errors. And, and that, that might override any consideration. That, but I, I accept what you're saying. There may well be a best formation for multiple drones. Got it. Yeah, just uh, when you mentioned, you know, potentially putting the last drone out of sight of the GPS jammers, what comes to my mind is, you know, basically having a string of them um, so you can have, you know, one drone outside of the GPS jamming and then maybe have... Oh, I'm no. sorry, I'm a bit deaf and I couldn't catch what you... <laughs> I'm, I'm, I missed it, I'm sorry. Yeah, yep. thanks. Well, let's thank Professor Anderson again for an amazing talk.